If you have your Bibles, turn with me over to Ruth chapter 3. And we're going to continue our story. So, um, in chapter 1, we learn that Ruth was met in Moab by a family, Naomi and her husband and two sons. And while there, Naomi lost her husband and then 10 years later, her two sons and went through tragedy. And it was all because they were trying to run away from the famine that was in Bethlehem. And it was something that they, as we learned that uh, we moved into chapter 2, that Bethlehem was still standing, and actually Naomi's family was doing quite well, even though the famine was going on. And it was very um, interesting that God still brought them back to a, a plan of restoration through even their wandering times. And as we start the chapter 3, I, I entitled this the, the Proposal. And that's what the, the entire chapter 3 is about. But it made me think, there are certain times when... Everybody's courtship is a little bit different. Everybody's proposal, everybody has a story. And I was thinking of some of our family members. Uh, Sherry has a grandpa by the name of Mel Beagle. Uh, he's went on to be the Lord now. He was 98 when he passed. But Mel met his wife, uh, and he only knew her for about two weeks. And about two weeks into their relationship, they went to coffee, and Mel looked over and said, Hey, I think we should get married. And Nella said, I do too. And then the next day on their lunch break, they got married. And then 68 years later, they were in love still to that day. And then uh, he had a son by the name of Ken, which is Sherry's dad. And he had an interesting story, too. It was, uh, he was actually dating a girl named Kim, and her twin sister, Marmy, walked by. And Marmy was much different than Kim. She was very sweet. She was very meek and just a, a servant attitude. And Ken just looked over and said, that's the girl that I'm going to marry. So he asked Kim, who's that? Very much like Boaz when he saw Ruth in the field. Who's this lady? And, yep, he broke up with uh, Kim at age 15 and started dating Marmy. And then at age 19, they were married, and they've been married for 46 years. Uh, and then we have a good friend by the name of Stephanie. Um, she met her husband. She literally met him at church and said, hey, um, I'd like to get to know you. And he said, well, I'm going to be serving overseas for the next year. So they got to know each other by letter. Uh, and they started just corresponding through just le writing letters back and forth. And as soon as he got back into the States, a week later, they got married. And they've been married for five years. So everybody has a story, but I think when you think about it, when you know it's the one, it's the one. And that's what we're going to see with Boaz and Ruth tonight. So let's get into verse 1 and 2 of our chapter 3. It says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So our story has progressed. We met Boaz in the fields in chapter 2. And so the harvest has been going on for a few weeks now, and the harvest is starting to wrap up because we know they're in the threshing floor. So they're taking the fruits of the labor in, and they're, they're beating it on the floor and then allowing the wind to blow off the chaff. So all that's left is the actual harvest. So he's separating that. Um, and it's interesting because at this point, Ruth and Boaz, the only contact they would have had with each other is in a group setting, always working on the field. They, they had never uh, been around each other except in a group setting. And we have a, an experienced matchmaker in Naomi. And let me tell you why she's experienced. Do you remember she had two sickly, uh, weak boys, and she found them beautiful wives. So she knows what she's doing here. So she gets involved, and... She knows that if you're going to have a proposal, if you're going to have this customary tradition in the Jewish setting, these guys are going to have to have some quality one-on-one -on -one time, and it's just not happening when they're working in a group setting. So she says, should I not seek rest for you? So Naomi, in her old age, she, she can't provide for Ruth, and she is really knowing in this time of the judges when things are just out of control and, and it, the environment's bad, and here's this godly man who has had this great reputation, and she says, if I want uh, Ruth to survive here, if I want her to be taken care of, she's going to have to get married because I can't do it. She's a stranger in this land. And the actual interesting, the Hebrew word here, rest, in the verse, I know I'm going to butcher it, but it's uh, manna watch. It just speaks of what a house is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a place of rest and security for a person. So when she says, I want rest for you, that's what she's saying in the Hebrew is, I want to find a home that has this for you, that has an area of rest and security. And she makes this statement, a question, is not Boaz our relative? Now, she doesn't need 
Ruth to confirm to her that Boaz is a relative. She's making a, a general statement, and that word relative, it means kinsman redeemer in the Hebrew. And again, this is where the Bible introduces this thought process. And this is not where Naomi is not coming in here trying to trap poor Boaz. Okay, he's, she's not saying, look, we're going to get him, and you're going to be on the hook, and you're going to be taken care of for the rest of your life. No, this was, this was rooted in a custom that began in ancient Israel. And Naomi is just reminding Ruth, saying, look, in fact, Boaz is a goel, or a redeemer. This is his job. This is his God-given right. And uh, a goel, or a redeemer, had specific roles. And uh, I picked out four primary ones. Well, the first one we find in Leviticus 25, 48, it says... After that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. So a redeemer was one that if a fellow Israelite was sold into slavery, especially a family member, he was the one that had the authority to go in and purchase. He was the one that had the responsibility to go in and purchase him back his freedom. So no, he's our family member. You don't get to keep him. So that was one of their roles. Another one was a pretty dramatic one. They were avenger of blood. It says in, in Numbers uh, 35, 19, they would actually have to bring justice, and it was capital punishment. So if a family member was murdered, this was this man's job to bring this person to justice by capital punishment. It was an eye for an eye. If you murdered someone, they would, your life was taken. So he was an avenger of blood for the family. Uh, and third thing was he was responsible to buy back family land. Leviticus 25, 25 says this, If, the, if thy brother be waxen poor and has sold away some of his possession. And if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. So again, he is, he's to buy back family land. He's not to just let it be taken and done with whatever. He, he keeps it in the family. This was his responsibility. And then the fourth one I picked is what we're doing here. He was also responsible to carry on a family name by marrying a childish, or a childless widow. And you'll read that in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. And that's what he's doing here. This is what uh, Naomi is calling him out, saying, Ruth, he's a redeemer. This is what his God-given authority, this is what he's been asked by the Lord to do. So when we think of Boaz, he's not just some random Bethlehem guy. He is a mighty man. He's a wealthy man. He's a warrior. He would have to be one that would have to chase these guys down and avenge. He was respected in the community. So he was a chieftain in the community. He wasn't just a bystander. He was a, a very devout man. So the question that Naomi is actually asking here makes perfect sense. If he has the God-given authority and the right, why aren't we asking him? So she's just reasoning with her. In that culture, it might even seem, or in our culture today, it might seem forward that Ruth is pursuing Boaz in this way, but it was totally acceptable in their day. Because if, think about it, if Boaz did not redeem Ruth, the name Elimelech would perish. Naomi would have no grandchildren. Everybody that she had who could carry on the name is now gone. So this union would raise up an heir to Elimelech and to Naomi. So this is important just as much as to, as to Naomi as keeping her husband's name alive as it is to taking care of Ruth. So she is deeply embedded in this. And this particular duty was always important because think about the time that we're living in, the judges. People were just killing people. They were robbing. They were stealing. And it was just really a dangerous and a hard time to live in. So this role was really important in the community that somebody would step up and say, look, I'm going to be the one that brings justice back to our family. So let's pick it up in verse 3. Naomi says, Wash therefore and anoint yourself and put on your cloak. And go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. And he will tell you what to do. And she replied, All that you say, I will do. And now Naomi is a good Jewish woman. Again, she's a great matchmaker. And at this point, she's thinking, Look, Ruth, all he has seen you as is a servant girl, a worker out in the field. It's time to get pretty, it's time to smell good, and allow him to see you as a woman for the first time. So she's, she's making him known. She knows how to attract a man. I'm sure she had to clean up her boys at one time. Look, guys, you're not going to attract a lady looking like this. You've got to get cleaned up. So this is what she's asking her to do. And she gives her a specific request. Wait until he's satisfied with dinner and asleep. So again, I've always heard that. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Make sure he's taken care of first. Meet his needs. And then she gives this request. She says, uncover his feet 
and lie down. And there's different teachings on this. There's some really good ones. But I want to urge that there is not an inappropriate thought in Naomi's mind here. This is not something suggesting any sexual contact to go lie with him at all. Rather, it's just a normal customary way that a servant showed respect to a master. They would lay at the, the master's feet waiting for instruction. So in the middle of the night, if the master needed something, they would respond and go respond. So this is just a normal customary way. And in that day, it was understood that when you lie down at, the, at somebody's feet, that was the role. But also what she's pushing into the Ruth's heart here is you're going to go to him and ask him a question, but you have to come to him humbly. Come to him as humbly as you can. And that's our first Christ connection in the chapter tonight is that when Christ came, he came humbly serving others. And we're getting to see that, and Ruth is coming to serve Boaz. She's reflecting the actual heart of Jesus here, saying, look, it's not all about me coming in and making myself known this way. Let me develop a relationship by serving him so he knows that I'm not just in this for money. I'm in this because I want a relationship with him. And this is also the wisdom of Naomi coming out. She didn't have Ruth many times. If there was a widow or someone who had been taken advantage of, they would come in and demand their rights. I demand you to marry me. I demand you to take care of me. Or they play the victim. Oh, what am I supposed to do? And she's instructing her, no, come to Boaz properly with dignity. And then Naomi said, he will tell you what you, he, he will tell you what you need to do. And this is just another testament of Boaz's character. Think of the times that we're in, the judges. Men were corrupt. Men were horrible, disdainable people. And this man, Boaz, has such a reputation that Naomi is saying, Ruth, I trust him that whatever he tells you, it's going to be respectful for you. It's going to be caring for you. And he's going to be of the utmost gentleman. So again, just speaking of his uh, testimony that he has in the community. And I think as men, we have the root desire for our wives to be submissive to our leadership. Not just a slave, but just to follow us. And that's the first thing here. Are we being men who have earned that right for submission? Are we being caring and kind and a concerned godly leader that Naomi had no question, he will treat you right. I've seen his character. I've seen his nature. He's earned that. Go be submissive to him. And it just makes it easier for our wives to trust us when we are treating them with love and respect. Because why? It's reflecting Jesus' nature as he loved the church. So it's comfortable for them to submit. Okay, ladies, I'm not leaving you out either, okay? This is for you. So, again, it's your desire for men, your husbands, to treat you like Boaz is treating Ruth. I mean, come on. I'm looking at him going, I don't blame you. This is a nice guy. He, he's very respectful. He, he's blessing her at every turn. He, he's just treating her with utmost kindness. And that, was, that would be my question. As women, do you show the same humble heart that Ruth is showing to Boaz? Are you showing that? Like Jesus showed you when he was humble, he came to serve you. And it's just a reminder that this book is so beautifully written that sometimes we forget the hopeless, dangerous situation that Ruth was in. And we're just thinking of a love story. But for Ruth, she was still in this, she was out in the middle of the night. Okay, it's midnight in the fields. And she's still working hard to be faithful to being a servant to Boaz. And then Ruth answers her with, all that you say to me, I will do. And this is very important because now Naomi's at, she's taking on the role of a discipler finally. It's taken her two chapters to wake up. She sees the hope of the Lord again and says, look, I still have something to offer to young Ruth. I want to disciple her. And Ruth is humbly and wisely receiving counsel from Naomi. And she's willing to be taught. So we, we're starting to see this discipler, disciplee uh, commitment here. And they pick it up in verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. So again, we're still in the time of judges. There's no government leadership. There's no police. There's no people protecting. The only people that were protected is your family had to protect themselves. So this was one of Ruth, uh, Boaz's uh, purposes. So the reason he's sleeping at the threshing floor, this was his harvest. This was his livelihood. This was his bounty for the whole next year. And he's protecting it. 
1 Samuel gives uh, an example, 1 Samuel 23, 1. It says, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Calah, and they robbed the threshing floors. This was something that had been going on for years, that, the, that this is the way they would come in. All the work had been done. The bounty was right there. So thieves and bandits were a real threat. They would just come in and rob the people. So Boaz, this mighty man, this warrior, is actually sitting at the foot of his bounty, and he's protecting it. So that's why he's there sleeping. So being out at night, Ruth was really in danger. If you think about this, so this is how much Naomi respected Boaz to say, I love Ruth, and I know if I put her beside Boaz, she's not only going to be respected, but as well protected. So she is in just total protection. And that's just our other Christ connection um, here as when he said she uncovered his feet in the night. Well, remember the, the lady that came to Jesus, and she uncovered his feet, and she washed it with tears in her hair. And... Again, she was just coming humbly to her Savior, but her life was in jeopardy. She was going to a Pharisee's house, and she was an unclean woman. A Pharisee had every right to stone her for what lifestyle that she had. She put her life in jeopardy. She put her life in the hands of Jesus, and he protected her while she was there. So we have another Christ connection coming in. And now Boaz is acting as that protection for Ruth here. And then in verse 8 it says, At midnight the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman laid his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. So it comes out, he is startled. Imagine this, you're in protection mode. You are asleep, and all you're thinking of um, as a dad, I do this, I sleep kind of halfway. I always listen for noises in the house, or the kid's awake. Is somebody coming in as an intruder? And that's in a nice, safe house. Well, he's in an environment where his life is on the line. He's probably sleeping next to his tools to keep himself safe. And then he's awakened by the presence of someone who's not supposed to be there. So this is alarming to him at first. Um, and just shows you how much God was with Ruth. Because Boaz could have hurt her in the middle of the night by waking up to someone startling him by his uh, produce. And it, and it didn't happen. He was calm. So he's alarmed at first. He's kind of startled. And then he just turns into curiosity when he hears the voice of a lady. And that probably was really weird. Why is there a lady out in the middle of the field at midnight? Do you know where you're at? You're in danger. Who are you? And that was the question I had. When's the last time we took a risk for the Lord? Not putting our physical life in jeopardy, but when have we had to step out in faith? When it was uncomfortable? When the situation wasn't just totally surrounded by protection? That's what Ruth is doing here. And she answers Boaz by saying, Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And culturally, all this was saying in the Hebrew was, I am a widow Take me as your wife. That was how they would say it. And this has actually been a normal practice in Arab nations since the earliest days. They would cover a widow. So anytime they would come, they would cover her. And that's how they claimed that lady for their wife. That's part of their ritual. And that's what she's asking to be. And even in Arab rituals today, they still use that. And uh, especially in Jewish marriages to this day, the man will throw the skirt over his wife. And it's to symbolize the protection that he's offering her, saying, she's under my protection as my wife. And that's what she's asking. She's desiring Boaz's protection by asking this. And we have another Christ connection right there. Do you remember when Jesus, he cried out, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, and his heart was just broken because he said, I desire to cover you as a hen would cover her children with with the wings. And they didn't want him. They didn't want him. But Boaz has been such a light, such a, um, a redeemer in Ruth's eyes. She's desiring, look, I want your protection. I want to be your wife. Take me as yours. And even God the Father, I love this because Christ reflects God. And in Ezekiel, we hear that God has the exact same intentions to people. It says in Ezekiel 16, 8, it says, When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord, and you became mine. Just a beautiful, majestic picture of God coming to someone almost like the the person that the Good Samaritan came to was broken, was beaten, nothing left. They were just, the clothes were even taken off. There was nothing left, and he was just covered by the garment. That's what God is offering. He's saying, I want that. And Jesus was the portrayal of that in human flesh and then Ruth goes on to say for you are a redeemer and it's just she's giving respect to Boaz she's coming to him properly 
and she's not demanding, she's not whining. She is properly responding to Boaz and allowing him to make the decision, am I going to redeem her or not? And we pick it up in verse 10, it says, And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. So he asked, you have not gone after young men. This is, gives you a little bit of intimate detail for Boaz. So clearly he has a desire to redeem Ruth. But this shows us there was an age difference. He was probably older. And I think it probably shows and exposes how honorable Boaz was. Even though he had the right, he could have pursued her. He didn't. Maybe he felt like he wasn't attractive enough as an older redeemer. Maybe he was like, maybe she would like to be with a younger man. But it was simply he didn't force himself on her. And I love that because Jesus never forces himself on anyone. He allows them to come willingly to him. He just offers up his love. No matter what they say, yes or no, he still offers it, but he doesn't force himself. And that's what uh, Boaz is doing here. And Ruth is allowing him to do it, saying, I don't want, I don't want to be forced into marrying you. And Boaz says, I don't want to force you to marry me. I want it to be a mutual, willing relationship. And this shows Ruth's heart. There were, so apparently there were young, attractive men who could have redeemed her. And her decision wasn't based off what would make me happy physically or what would ha- make me happy financially. There might have been more wealthy men than Boaz, whether poor or rich. So he probably landed somewhere in the middle of these guys. But her decision wasn't based off any of the physical attributes of Boaz. It was his character and his nature. She was basing off this man is kind. This man is protective. This man is honorable. This is the man that I want to go after. And I was thinking of, um, we run the women's discipleship house in Olympia. And I would say 90% of the women that fell away since we've been there, it has always been because they fell for men who were not right. They, they were a bad influence. They were not living a godly life. And they were more worried about the physical than the spiritual. The ones that have made it have always been, my eyes are on Christ. When Christ brings someone to me, that'll be great. Until then, I am happy and I'm satisfied in him. And that's what Ruth is doing. She's like, I know there's young men that would probably have me, but I don't want them. I want who God has for me. And it goes on to say, for all my fellow townsmen, know that you are a worthy woman. So Boaz is giving the reason that he's redeeming Ruth, one of them. And it was the same thing that she saw in him. It was her character that stood out more than anything. There was probably a physical appearance because we noticed that when he walked in and he saw her in the field, he said, who's this lady? She stuck out to him, so she's probably attractive. But even more so, it was her character that really, she had a testimony throughout the whole community of Bethlehem. In the Hebrew, Boaz is actually calling Ruth a strong woman with moral strength, with integrity and virtue. It was the same as the writer when he opened and introduced Boaz. He said he was a worthy man. He was a mighty man of valor. It's the same uh, Hebrew phrase here that Boaz is calling Ruth. She is a mighty woman of valor. And this is what stuck out to him. And this is another biblical principle that Jesus taught us through Paul, is that we are to be equally yoked. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So as a godly man, Boaz was looking for this. Look, I, I want to follow the Lord. My mom has taught me this. It's been part of my life. It's my, part of my upbringing. I'm not just going to marry anybody. I want to marry someone who is, has that same desire to be a witness in the community. And we must be pulling the same direction in our relationships as each other, that we're equally pulling toward the Lord. And Ruth and Boaz were going to be doing this as an equally pulling unit to be a public witness in their community. In verse 12 it says, And now it is true that I am a Redeemer, yet there is a Redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight in the morning if he will redeem you. Good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then, as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So he says, lie down until the morning. And this is where some people say, well, they spent the night together. But again, you have to think about the story in context. He would have been crazy at 1230 at night to send Ruth out in the field and say, you go back home. Okay? And I'm going to stay here. 
No, he's continuing to offer protection. Come lay at my feet all night. I will make sure you're safe. And when it's light and when it's safe for you to arise, then I'll send you home. So it's not an inappropriate advance or anything. He is just wanting to make sure she is safe from danger. But we do have one potential problem here. We have bachelor number two. He is here. There is a redeemer nearer than I. So there is this other man who had more of a God-given right because he was closer in his kinsmanship to Elimelech. We don't know what relationship he was, but he was just closer. And Boaz couldn't exercise his right without this other redeemer relinquishing his. And then he goes on to say, but if he is not willing to redeem you, then I will redeem you. So here is Boaz's submission to the Lord. He didn't go in and say, I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to make this thing happen. He didn't look foolish. He was actually trusting in the Lord, allowing God, saying, look, I'm going to do this thing properly, and we're allow God to work through it. And that's what 1 Corinthians says in 1440. If we do everything, we're to do it in decency and in order. That's how we know God is in it. He's not an author of confusion. And it's kind of also a way that he was confirming God's will. And I remember when we started uh, talking about church planning, Sherry and I, we were over two large ministries within reach, with a big community outreach. We had Redemption Place going on, and then all of our other duties, and and then we get this crazy notion, let's church plant. And the confirmation I had said, Lord, if you want us to do this, I have to be able to take this to the elders and our senior pastor, John, and he has, they have to approve it, or I don't want to be an author of confusion. And we went in there and had that meeting, and for 15 minutes I was kind of sweating as they kind of looked and heard my story and what we wanted to do up here. And then uh, the question came out, well, what would you expect us to say? I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, we're, we're behind you. We want to do it. And it was 100% approval from all of them. And that's just what he's asking here. Um, with, this, with this gentleman, I want everything to work out the way God has illustrated. I want to follow God's way. Just again, another testament to his, um, his testimony in his life. And it says in verse 14, So she lay at his feet until morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it out, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. So we have this questionable thing, let it not be known. And the only, the only idea is here, Boaz isn't trying to hide anything. Ruth isn't trying to hide anything. Boaz wants to be respectful. He wants to go to this other redeemer and be the person to say, look, I want to ask this of you. I don't want to hear, I just don't want you to hear it from someone else, or I don't want Ruth's reputation to be tainted in any way. I want to do this thing right. And I was thinking when Pastor John, when we we're talking about church planning, he asked us not to tell anyone about it. He said, don't tell anyone because I want to be the one to break the news. And he was our authority. He wants to be the one that says, I know what's going on and I'm fully for it. But he, there's a way of doing things in a godly way. And that's all he's wanting to do. I want to be the one to, to approach the Redeemer personally and bring it to him. And then there's this questionable thing. This, this one is actually one of those parts where even evangelical theologians kind of, I'm not sure why they do this, but they say it must be a mistake in the Bible here, and it's not. He says he measured out six measures of barley. And basically what they do is they try to measure out six measures of barley in today's standards. Well, between Hebrew and Arabic and old ancient math systems that didn't really work, and then you try to put that in British and American math terms, it doesn't work. And when I researched this, the best that I could tell you is six measures of barley, one measure is about an armful. So if you put six bundles, she would have had a tire cloak around it. And that's why she needed to carry it. So it was, it was bountiful, but the, they would say, well, it's too much. It's too many liters for her to carry on her own. No, it's about six measures. It would be six armfuls. And she just carried uh, a good stack back. And it, this was important because it had significance. And the reason why is in Jewish cultures, you could not release a slave without providing for them. You had to give them something to be reestablished, and especially female slaves. You couldn't just do that. So when you're sending a slave out or a servant, and you're giving them something to get them started with, what's your intention? Your intention is to free them. And Naomi picked up on this. She was really excited um, that he was going to provide for her. And it's interesting because he provided enough. He didn't know the answer yet. He didn't know if he was going to be Redeemer or if this other man was going to be Redeemer yet. But he provided enough to take care of her either way it turned out. He was saying, here's enough barley you are taken care of until this matter has been discussed and one of us redeems you. So he is providing for her. 
And here's something to just to think about. In Jewish traditions, um, there's a custom that says the six measures of barley might represent the six devout men who were Ruth's descendants. Um, we know King David, the prophet Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and then finally the Messiah, Christ Jesus. So there's six devout men through Scripture. Um, not something we put a lot of stock into, but it's just something nice to think about. Like there, was, there were six men who came from her bosom. And actually some of the depictions say the way that Jewish ladies would carry the barley, the way she wrapped it, she might have went home and it would look like she was actually pregnant because she was carrying it in front because she would hook it around. So she was um, almost like she was pregnant going home and it would be symbolic of this. So again, just something nice to think about. In verse 16 it says, And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. So again, that gift was important to Naomi. It symbolized this man is going to set you free one way or the other. And when he's providing for you, not knowing if he's going to be the redeemer or not, it just showed his, his desire, his urgency to take care of the matter. So she's thinking, this is going to be taken care of today. He is really wanting to deal with this. Um, she actually says, for the man will not rest, but will settle, settle the matter today. So she's telling her to wait. Don't do anything else. Don't try to pursue. Don't try to work anything on your own. God is in control. Allow him now to do what he does best and work in your life. And then that's something that is interesting we have the, the biblical principle of people that just fall away because of that waiting period. We know the, the five foolish virgins who are waiting for the marriage feast who did not wait and keep themselves prepared for the marriage. And then we had five who did, and they fell away. So we have to be careful not to be lost in that waiting time. We are waiting on a Redeemer. We are waiting on the second coming of Christ. But it's just a, it's important to remember. We have to encourage ourselves here. Um, and then just in practical, just... Remembering that obedience in everyday life, like Ruth is doing, like Boaz is doing, it is just, that is the way that we reflect the character and nature of God to others. And that is the reason that we still have breath today, is to point others to His glory. And the book of Ruth, it came along um, in just a irresponsible, living, godless time. And it brought the people back when this was written. It just reminded them that they had a greater responsibility. They had a greater faithfulness to God. They had a reason for being here. It wasn't just for themselves. And this call applies to us today, clearly. And then we see, we've seen Christ and connections throughout this whole thing as Boaz is really reflecting the character and nature of Christ this whole chapter. But the theme of rest was in this chapter from the beginning to the end, resting in Him, resting knowing that He's working, that He's behind the scenes. And Jesus says this about his rest in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And that's my question. Will we allow Jesus to be our Redeemer tonight and then walk home with our hands full of blessings? Will we allow that to happen? We're not putting our hands to it. felt as the story of Boaz and Ruth is. It warms our hearts. But the whole reason the story is even in the Bible is to point us to one who is, we have a greater redeemer than Boaz himself in, in Christ Jesus. And that's why as Ruth is waiting anxiously to see what is going to happen when Boaz is going to redeem her, we're waiting today, waiting for Jesus' return. He started the redeeming process, but he's gone to prepare us a place. And he wants to bring us intimately with him. And there's things that try to steal that away from us or steal our joy from us in that waiting process. But I'm declaring to you that he is still faithful. He is still in the process of redeeming us. And as we partake of this tonight, this is what we're doing. Is we're proclaiming until he comes again to everyone that is around us that he is greater than Boaz. He is the only redeemer. He not only warms the heart, he transforms the heart. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Go ahead and take of the bread. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. They to choose. Lord, we just thank you that you came on the cross. You saved us, but you have gone to prepare us a place. And you did not leave us comfortless. You left us the Holy Spirit to guide us, to walk us through this as more than conquerors. And God, I just pray that our spirits, our soul would wake up to that. I pray that the gospel would just become burning on our tongues and that we would be so emboldened, God, that no matter who we're around, what time of day, God, that that would be our focus. And God, that we would no longer grow weary and waiting on you, but we would allow you to renew our strength, to mount us up with wings of eagles, God. And God, I just pray that as tonight we would leave here changed and proclaimed and that you are the great Redeemer. One greater than Boaz has come, and that's Jesus. And we just ask this in your name. Amen.